are you to those of you who are coming for the first time in some time? Uh, my name is Jorge Aduani, I'm director of the Cuban Research Institute here at FIU, which organized today's event. And because of the topic and the timing, we're providing some snacks which you may have seen already, so please feel free to consume during or after the talk. Unfortunately, we couldn't get uh, we can only get some food associated with Cuban cuisine. The topic of this talk is Cuban, Puerto Rican, and Dominican cuisine, but after all, we're in Miami, so. I, I want to introduce briefly our guest speaker. I know this is gonna be a very informal, small group, but uh, I, I still think it's worth going through some of her uh, wonderful professional accomplishments, and I just want to share that with you. So Dr. Melissa Fuster is an assistant professor of public health nutrition at CUNY Brooklyn College and also a faculty fellow at the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Before joining Brooklyn College, uh, Professor Buster was a provostial faculty fellow in food studies at New York University. She's an expert on food policy and public health nutrition, and also is working on the historical, social, and cultural uh, factors that affect what people eat and what they consume. She has conducted uh, research uh, on minority populations in the US and Latin America, has published several articles and reviews on food and nutrition in, in peer-reviewed professional journals, that is Food, Cultural Nutrition, Public Health Nutrition Journal, and Ecology of Food and Nutrition. She also has a very informative, I, I think, uh, blog called Comida Studies, uh, where she seeks to make her academic research more widely available to a broader public, so you can just Google that and you'll find some of her, her work there with uh, some pictures also that uh, we included in our flyer. Uh, Professor Fuster uh, completed her PhD in food policy and applied nutrition at Tufts University. Her doctoral dissertation entitled Healthy Eating in Vulnerable Communities in El Salvador focused on healthy eating perceptions in resource poor Salvadorian communities. She also holds a BA in sociology and anthropology from our university at FIU. So welcome back to your alma mater. We're very proud of her academic achievement and professional success. I actually teach in the same department, although now it has a different uh, name, Global and Social Cultural Studies. Melissa's current research focuses on the socio-political and cultural factors affecting culinary and nutritional outcomes in the Hispanic Caribbean, so Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and its transnational communities here in the U.S. And I imagine today's talk forms part of this larger project. She's currently working on her first book manuscript, which I was uh, fortunate to read, entitled The Politics of Hispanic Caribbean Cuisines, which I think will make a terrific of Latino studies, and I can't really tell whether this is a, you know, something new in the field of food and nutrition studies, but I imagine it is also something from reading the her proposal because um, Hispanic Caribbean cultures have not featured prominently in uh, studies of food and nutrition. So please help me welcome Dr. Lisa Bustet. generous introduction and also for, for the invitation. I'm really excited to be back here. Uh, we're thinking back, I graduated more than 10 years ago. So even walking around here, I was starting to get some flashbacks when I was coming into the library. So it's very, very nice to, to be back here. So again, thank you to Professor Juani for inviting me and also for the people at the Cuban Research Institute for all their help in making this possible. And also for the pastelitos, of course. Hope you get to enjoy them because this is not the only food picture. There will be more, so you might get that. Um, as Professor Duani mentioned, what I'm going to be presenting today is part of a larger book project. As my first book, so I'm tackling um, this big task. And the book project seeks to address the political, social, and structural factors that um, shape how cuisines are formed and also maintain in context of migration. And part of what the book seeks to do is linking that literature from migration, Latino, Latin American studies to what we know in public health nutrition. Because I feel both um, have something to contribute to each other so that we can have a better understanding of how we eat when we are away from our homes. Um, and a lot of this works, what it does is that it tries to challenge the existing notion of a lot of in public health nutrition where assimilation and acculturation is mostly linked to negative health outcomes. So basically the literature says that the longer we stay here in the US, the sicker we get. 
So I'm trying to see if that is the case with all populations because a lot of what we know um, is actually coming from Mexican American communities in the US. What I'm going to be presenting today mostly comes, all of it comes from interview data that I conducted in New York City with Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans. No, no. Okay. And the purpose of this, uh, again, in, in New York City, we do have a large population of Cubans and Dominicans. I am Puerto Rican, so I, I'm more and more immersed in that Puerto Rican tu experience. De frente. And I wanted to come here to get your your feedback on that Cuban experience that, that you have here in Miami. So my plan is to present um, for about half an hour or so, and then I'll come and sit with you so that we can have a, a conversation about these findings. So as I think most of you know, um, our Cocina Criolla in the Caribbean results from that confluence of the native uh, Indians together with the Spanish colonizers and also the African slaves that were brought in that process. The insular geography, the fact that it's, there these are these islands, um, I think distinguishes our cuisine from that of continental Latin America. Where, for example, in Mexico, in Mesoamerica, there's a larger presence of corn, tortillas, where in the Caribbean we see more yuca and other things like that. Um, we also have the staples of the cuisine, such as, of course, the pork and the rice that are very important that come from that Spanish influence. And then um, there are many in, uh, influences that we get from the African population coming only, not only from their food traditions back in the continent, but also from the slave diets and the foods that they were given as part of that um, slavery process. So the interesting thing that I find here, especially looking at diets in the context of migrations, is that it, our traditional diets are born out of this migration movement. And again, I also want to say before I start that the way I look at these three places, I, I look at them as nations, knowing, of course, that Puerto Rico is not a nation in the political sense, but in my work I do see it as a nation in the, in the cultural sense. And that being said, I also, of course, take into account that colonial situation in, in Puerto Rico, the same way that I also take the political aspects in the other two countries. So from, from the time that these, again, these communities are born out of, of movement um, from the old world to the new world, and as they were forming, they have continued to move. We know, um, for example, that there are historical communities of Cubans and also Puerto Ricans in New York City. And I know that there was a lot of um, trade between the Caribbean and the US, for example. I know there were Cuban communities in New Orleans and other places. So it's not, even though today we tend to think, of course, here in Miami as the epicenter of the Cuban community, historically, there, there have been other places. And the Cuban, the interesting thing is that the Cuban and Puerto Rican community in New York City, they moved together as part of these initial struggles for independence. So we do see a lot of that initial interaction um, from these communities living and, and working together, especially as part of the tobacco industry, as you see that picture up there. Um, now, the, the Puerto Rican Great Migration, I guess, <coughs> mostly associated with the large waves of Puerto Ricans coming to New York as part of the um, industrialization project in Puerto Rico that, of course, Professor Duany can give an entire larger talk about this. Um, and that was mostly starting in the 1940s. Again, before this happened, there were larger communities already existing, but we had that larger flow of Puerto Rican immigrants. And then when we think of uh, the Cuban migration as I don't, I don't, maybe I don't need to tell you here, um, it happened that large wave after the Cuban Revolution, where Cubans again came mostly to Miami, but then they also distributed either also to Puerto Rico, and some people also went to Union City in New Jersey, so we do see still that interaction. Now, Dominicans, they came a little bit later, again, with the caveat that there were Dominicans living here, 
but the larger waves came mostly in the 1960s, and they came, and when they came to New York, they also started interacting with that Puerto Rican community, and we also see that interaction in Puerto Rico, where unfortunately we see a lot of undocumented migration coming from the Dominican Republic to the island. Some people stay there, but some people then use it to travel to New York City. So New York is the epicenter of Dominican and Puerto Rican migration, but still outside of Florida, that area houses the second largest population of Cubans. So even though I, I know that uh, I am not able to get that pure Cuban experience I could get if I move my research to Miami, which might happen in the future. I think New York City provides that unique setting, being very, very urban, and also it's not just us. We are also interacting with a lot of different cultures in that context. That makes it, I feel, a, an interesting place to see how we are able to maintain our, our culture through our food with these other many, many influences that we have. So when I wanted to focus today, again, this is a piece of a larger project, and I'm happy to talk further at the Q&A. But I wanted to see how these cuisines, how these cocina criollas are experienced and also defined in these new homes. We know from the literature that migration is a very disruptive process. It affects socioeconomic status, family relationships, and that also, of course, affects food. And the literature says a lot about how, as we move, we move with food in our luggage, with cookbooks. So we have, we want to maintain that food culture. But then, in some cases, we are unable to. And also, how we define and relate to that national identity that comes with our food might change depending on how we get to where we are. So I wanted to start. Um, that this, this is a book, a chapter from my book, and uh, the chapter starts with this exchange here. This exchange um, took place at one so-called Spanish restaurant, Spanish in New York City, they used for Cuban, Dominican, all of it together as a Spanish restaurant in El Barrio in East Harlem. And this happened, uh, I mean, smell, if you smell the sofrito, the bachata in the background, and I sat with Jose at, the, at this small table at this restaurant, and after talking with him about how he got to New York City, and I, I asked him something that I felt was a simple question. How would you describe your traditional cuisine? And his response, his response kind of got me by surprise because he, he said, well, it would be difficult because I, I don't know. And then I asked him, but you are Puerto Rican, right? I know you as a Puerto Rican. And he said, yes, but I, I eat American food. So that, um, for me, was really interesting that he had to, to stop and think about it, especially because this, of course, I'm using um, pseudonymous, it's not real name, it's not Jose, but Jose is somebody that, in the Puerto Rican community in New York City, is very, very active in promoting the traditional culture. So it was, again, really, really interesting to see how, how he felt he wasn't an expert because he wasn't raised in in Puerto Rico. He moved to New York City when he was 10 years of age. Um, and also, as I continue interviewing other Puerto Ricans that were born and or raised in New York City, I continue to encounter this um, hesitancy to say, oh, I know what Puerto Rican food is, or qualifying their responses saying, well, you know, I am New Rican, so I do eat different things. So that was, that was really, really interesting. Um, Now all of the, yeah, I think all of the Puerto Rican informants that were either born in New York City or raised in New York City, they had a chance to visit Puerto Rico either one time in their lives or at some point, and they had a chance to see what, what we eat back in the island. And, and these experiences, in a sense, provided a framework of, of comparison to what they were eating in New York City versus what they thought people were eating back in Puerto Rico. And something that I found really interesting is that people talk about back there, the natural Puerto Rican diet, really linked about to this um, imaginary of, of this 
countryside, the farm, that natural, natural diet. Um, and this quote that you see here um, comes from this very young man, he's um, John, for the purpose of this, that he just recently started traveling to the island, and he was amazed about, again, that he was rediscovering his culture through food, but still I found it interesting. And I say this is interesting because I, I was born and raised in the capital in San Juan. And this imagery of, of this wasn't my reality. You know, we do have a lot of fast foods. It's very, very urban. So it's interesting to see that um, imaginary that they had here. However, a similar framework of comparison was not available to a lot of my Cuban informants. Because, of course, the travel restrictions, some people, either they were born in Cuba or a lot of them were born here in Miami, didn't have a chance to go back and see what, what the island food looks like. And these informants also qualified their response as saying, well, you know, I can tell you about Cuban food, but with the Miami version, because I don't know what's, what's eaten in Cuba. <coughs> However, some Cubans did have a chance to go and visit later as a <coughs> And this uh, young man, Carlos, um, he was, he was born and raised here in Miami and had a chance to visit two times. And actually, when I interviewed him, he had just come back like two weeks before. So he had those um, ideas fresh in his mind. And, and I know this is a longer quote than I usually do, but I thought it was so interesting that when I asked him what are the differences that you see, he saw the differences in the things that were, that were missing that the cuisine was a sim much simpler version than what he experienced here in Miami. And he also talked about Cuban-American cuisine as this Americanized, obese, excessive uh, cuisine um, compared to, to what he saw in Cuba. And another thing he was really, he expressed a lot of surprise, was that he had this idea of, Cuban, of Cuba being something like Hialeah. And he talked about it being very, unsophisticated, and then he was really surprised about the sophistication and culture that he found in Cuba. Now, this is a case of somebody, again, that was born here, but then when I spoke with people that, that were raised in the island and then moved here, or that recently moved here, they spoke the, about the few memories of the foods they had back then. And some memories were very distant, of course, of people that moved here in the 1960s, they had more distant memories. Um, for example, I, I spoke with this woman, Isabel, and she left Cuba in the 1960s, and while she was really eager to go and visit nowadays, um, she has not been back. And when I asked um, about what she remembered, she talked about the coffee, that somehow the memory of that coffee is something that, that, you know, that she still carried with her. And then I had this conversation with this man that he moved here in, he moved to, from Cuba to Colombia in 1989 um, because he had a wife there, so he ended up moving there before coming here to Miami. And when he spoke about that move, he spoke about a change in what he called la psicología del estómago. <laughs> so I think, you know, I, I don't need to translate the psychology of the stomach. And I was like, okay, so what? What is that psychology of the stomach? And he described the psychology of the stomach as a, as a stomach that's not accustomed to eat what it asks for. Um, talking about the lack of variety of food in Cuba, and he said that it wasn't that he was hungry. I mean, he had food, but then there was no variety. So he recalled the experience when, where in Colombia, he had the chance to eat this hamburger and just seeing the food, like you see what he says here, that it was as if he was looking at a new pair of shoes, again, that, that variety that he saw. So now talking more about, you see, the food is coming in here. <laughs> talking more about how people uh, describe the cuisine, as I started seeing some of those uh, difficulties that people were encountering defining their cuisines, I said, well, okay, can you describe what is a typical breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then that allowed me to see which foods they were talking about. Um, when I started, and it's something that I'll come back to uh, later, 
one of the most striking differences was in breakfast. That Dominica said that the breakfast is, was really, really strong. And here you see, um, this is a picture of mangu. I don't know if you're familiar with mangu, so it's really, really heavy. And he, this young man was talking about how they were raised to think that you need to eat this hearty breakfast. And then that was really contrasting with the Puerto Rican and Cuban breakfast, which is coffee and, and toast. They're very, really simple. And then um, in terms of lunch, lunch was described as the heaviest meal by the Puerto Rican and the Cuban informants and as the lightest meal by, by the Cuban informants. And again, this I know this varies a lot by family and how much you're able to eat if you're working, for example, some Dominicans spoke about when they were back home, they were able to go back back to their homes for, for lunch, whereas in the US, they were not able to do that. Now, these descriptions of these comidas, I don't think it will surprise you that rice was seen as the backbone of the traditional diet, as this indispensable ingredient that without rice, there is no meal. And here you see again that that love for rice from these Dominican and, and these Puerto Rican informants. But then some of the, of the Cuban informants recounted this fact um, in a critical manner. So they spoke about this attachment that, that Cubans have with, with rice, as you see here. Uh, that what? Frijoles without rice, rice is an attachment. So he was arguing that there are other things that we can eat aside from rice. And this centrality of, of rice that we have in our diet is explained by historians. For example, there is this Puerto Rican historian that wrote the history of the Puerto Rican diet. And he sees this as a habit that was formed from times where we did, really didn't have a lot of variety in our diets, and then foods like this that get set in our culinary imaginary as a meal that is nutritionally, nutritionally filling and also that Again, that you get some nutrients out of it. Now, this so this the thing with rice and then other traditional foods. When people started talking about this, there was also a, this realization that a lot of the things that we we imagine or we say are traditional come from a time of poverty back when the nations were in information. And here you see um, this idea coming from a Cuban informant that she was saying how something as Cuban as roca vieja or vaca frita, she talked about it as something that came from a time of poverty, even calling it as a, that was our dog food. So again, it's really interesting to see how something that is central to the cuisine is also tied to these times of, of scarcity. And then when I spoke, I also asked people about times because we all have them where we don't have a lot of money or even time. And then people uh, um, responded with saying, well, when we didn't have a lot of money growing up, we might eat cornmeal or, or viandas, things like that. And one dish that was common across the three groups was rice, white rice with fried egg. I don't know if any of you have a memory of this dish here. Uh, but it was something that people mentioned a lot, and what was interesting is that even though these were, as you see here, these were dishes that were tied to a time where there was not a lot of money, where parents were working, they also became kind of comfort foods. So people spoke about this dish, I mean, I see it right now and it looks amazing for me, um, this comforting thing about foods that were tied to those times of, of poverty. And in the case of, of Cubans, of course, they, they also not only spoke about these foods in times of, of scarcity, they, some of, of them also recounted memories of that initial migration. And one informant, um, Sandra, she's the one that came in the 1960s, um, she recalled, for example, La Caja del Refugio and saying how um, her mother would make up with whatever was given and was able to recreate dishes such as Tocino del Cielo using powder meal. So again, you see that um, having, doing with what you have and then how you you make those um, times that were tied with poverty and scarcity 
and as a nice memory that, that then she had. Okay, so another thing that I was very interested in understanding is how food becomes comida. I mean, when we grow up in our homes, the food we are given by our parents are, are just our foods. We don't tend to think this is Puerto Rican food, this is Cuban food. So I, I asked this to, to my informants to see when, when this distinction between my and the other foods started happening. And for many of, uh, of these informants, they spoke about, um, of, of course, thinking that the food was the norm, for example, and a lot of it was for informants, uh, Cuban informants born here, that Cuban food is everywhere, so it was just commonplace to eat Cuban food, and there wasn't that distinction unless they went to a Chinese restaurant or they, they were going to other places. Um, and again, thinking that, that it wasn't only, it was, a lot of them said that it was only until they left Miami, for example, to study in New York or other places that they're starting to like, okay, this is, this is my food and then that's their food. In general, the distinction between my food and other people's foods came from when they were eating outside of the home. And you have this first experience here from Raquel that she was born and raised in East Harlem and I mean, if you think of West Side, West Side Story, the Italians and Puerto Ricans living together, she was growing up at, around that confluence of people. And she said that she had two, these two friends, Sally and Roro, and that they would invite her to come to, to their house. And that's where she learned, okay, Italians eat pasta, we eat rice. So you started seeing those distinctions. And then for others that also grew up in the States, um, a lot of that distinction happened when they were in the school meals. So when you open your lunch book and you have this smell of, of our food and then you see that people, the reaction of other people are like, oh, what is that? <laughs> and then you have that other reaction. So that um, Frances here, this Dominican informant, really spoke about that in, in detailed ways. <clears throat> now, uh, this graph here, um, I know, I mean, we can't spend a lot of time here, but this one uh, comes from, I took every food that people mentioned and then started to see areas of, of overlap and, and areas that were unique. And from this and also from the conversations, you, I think we can agree that taken together this Caribbean diets describe very similar cuisines with staples, of course, the rice, the beans, bacalao, tostones, all of that was, was very much in common. Um, and there were other things that we share, of course, uh, more one, and we'll, uh, I'm gonna talk next about the distinctions that they made, but here was again, uh, how they distinguished based on what they spoke about. So again, you see a lot of overlap in the main meal components when you think of your lunch, dinner, breakfast. But then I start, I start seeing more distinctions when we look at the snack and the sweet foods. So you see, um, for those of you not familiar with Puerto Rican cuisine, a lot of it this is a list of fried goodness that we have in our, <laughs> in our cuisine, and then we have some sweet. So it's interesting that the distinctions based on the dishes that people mention come more from those snack and celebration foods. And then of course, blend, even though I do have it, as an overlap between Puerto Rican and Cuban, it's something that is very common across Latin America, but it was that the Dominican informants did not mention, so I didn't include it here. However, I wanted to ask this question directly, instead of me making assumptions, to see how they view the food of, of the other Caribbean. And when I, when I asked this question, um, <laughs> okay. Um, when I asked this question, this is a, was another area that, that surprised me a little bit when I was speaking with, with the Cuban informants, because a lot of them said, well, I don't know anything about Puerto Rican or Dominican cuisine. I don't know about the Caribbean. Um, if, 
So for me, I asked him, well, you live in New York City where you have a large presence, but that's when I started to, to realize that these three islands that I tend to think of as sisters, I think when they move places, we tend to see more as distant cousins in, in some way, especially with the food. And when I, I spoke about this with one of the, of the Cuban informant, Luz, that she was born and raised here, and she tried to explain it in, in a way that, from her experience growing up here, how she was raised more in this cost, co cultural cluster. She said, she said that, well, we went to high school with, with Cubans, so everything was around Cubans, so we didn't really have that interaction with, with others. Um, and then in New York City, I asked, well, you don't have any Puerto Rican, Dominican friend, and they said no. Um, so that, that, was, that was interesting. <clears throat> but still, the, among the people that were able to distinguish or talk about the other cuisines, they spoke, well, you know, there's not that much of a, of a difference. Um, here you see this is a Cuban informant that knew about these, these other foods. He did have Puerto Rican friends and lived in areas where he was able to test uh, taste the cuisine. And he talked about same foods but different ways of cooking. And also he, here you see um, the interesting thing about New York City where he spoke about intermarriage that a Dominican marries a Puerto Rican so you have that um, interconnection in the food that you also see in the restaurant. So it, he spoke a lot about that, that mix there. And then thinking about those specific, I asked, well, okay, are there any specific things that you would distinguish between your food and the other two? And a lot of the distinctions came, um, again, the tweaking and seasoning, a lot of naming differences, but the main one was uh, beans in name and color. So it was, well, Cubans, they eat frijoles negros, and we eat habichuela roja. So even the name we call the, the beans is, is different. And this is something, um, the way we call red beans is really is common in Dominican Republic and in Puerto Rico. And in talking with these informants, I also realized about other interesting things that we had in common that honestly I wasn't aware of. For example, I don't know if you are aware that we call the fruit um, China, you know what that is? China? No. Naranja. 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 So we have this peculiarity, and I, I don't know still where it comes from, that we call orange China. And then Dominicans were saying, well, we do that too. And we have other, other similarities like that that I thought were, were interesting. Um, but again, even though in, in the way they spoke about it, I could see as the researcher these similarities. When, when Puerto Ricans start making these distinctions, they were making closer connections with, with Cubans. And you see this, this here, um, I really, it's Spanglish, um, where Raquel says, well, La Cubana, I think it's like our food. And then she's like, I don't know why. There's this connection, um, the pajaro with the two wings, you know, that, that poem from Lola Rodriguez de Dio, that there's this, Imagine in the Cuba and the Puerto Rican imaginary that we're very culturally and historically close 